The world we live in is just so full of things we don't understand, and being the curious humans that we are, we naturally try to seek these things out, and doing so has led us to remarkable discoveries and inventions that we could have never imagined or even possibly conceptualized over a hundred years ago. We've defeated disease, built into the sky itself, and even created machines that could take us beyond the clouds and into the stars. If our ancestors could have seen what we have created, I'm sure many of them would see us as gods or some sort of supernatural creature. Our innate curiosity and lust for knowledge, however, has not always led us to greatness. True evil and darkness have also been uncovered in humanity's quest for knowledge, and in the end, I fear that this may be our doom. I do not uh, say this from the standpoint of a great philosopher who has simply pondered these things. Uh, no, I, I say this because I I've actually seen it and I was a part of it. I experienced it. <sighs> the event I'm about to relate to you is true in its entirety. This I swear. I feel certain that it will fall on deaf ears and many of you will believe me as this just being another spooky story meant to give you cheap thrills, but I promise you that that is neither my intent nor my purpose. The, the purpose of this story is simply to warn you what lurks beyond the veil of what we can see and understand. To show you what awaits us in the darkness. Even I, I, even I myself don't quite understand it. What I'm about to tell you has happened, and I feel certain that it will happen again, so without further ado, let me begin. In 1971, a not-so-well-known scientist began preparations on an extremely secretive project, known simply as the Harbinger Experiment. I'd like to keep the identity of this scientist secret for personal reasons, so throughout the recording, I'll refer to him as Zimmerman. Zimmerman's background is unclear at best beyond 1971. All that is known about him before that time is that he grew up somewhere in Maryland with a strange fascination of the occult and supernatural. This later made him an outcast among fellow scientists due to how scoffed upon metaphysical ideologies was and still is at the time. Zimmerman's opinions concerning the otherworldly were not the sole cause of him being outcasted though. It was his methods that made him widely unaccepted among his peers. Zimmerman was well known for his time for being ruthless and cold beyond measure. He never cared about the means. All that mattered to him was simply the results. And if he predicted the results would be valuable enough, anything would be worth attaining them. It was this insatiable and brutal lust for the truth that made him feared among those who knew him. And the few that did know of him and did not fear him believed in him and followed him and his work closely. The word Harbinger itself is such a mysterious and intimidating, has such a mysterious and intimidating taste to it. Maybe it's the way that it rolls off our tongues or Maybe it's simply due to the association with the project, but the word always seems to carry a certain amount of doom with it. Which would make sense. The word itself means to warn or forbade. I can't imagine Zimmerman's reasoning for giving this experiment this title, but in retrospect, it fits perfectly. Zimmerman came to a select few of us, me being one of them. He told us that he was working on something big, that he needed people who could work and keep confidentiality, and just simply not spread idle gossip about his work. Well, he did not tr fully trust some of us. He did know that we were professionals, and for one reason or another, we were all in dire need of employment. I had worked at a local clinic as a doctor, but I was caught stealing medication and I was promptly fired. This left a very very dark mark on my resume, and since then on, it's been hard to find a job. I was also a native to Alaska, and I lived near where the experiment would take place. So, I guess you could say I was a convenient choice. As you can imagine, I jumped at the opportunity. It was hard not to, s <laughs> it was hard not to when I saw a payout. 
15 of us were hired in total. Some were colleagues of his that had been working with him for a while, while some of us were maintenance workers and a few were hired as private security. I was the only medical professional to be hired, and it is still a wonder how we even attained the funds necessary for the experiment. I would not be wholly surprised if his financing was not entirely legal, but legal or not, I needed the money and he was paying, so looking back, it's a decision I would have come to regret. After Zimmerman attained his money, he used it to buy a relatively large plot deep in the frozen wilderness of Alaska. And upon that piece of land, Zimmerman built a concrete structure, not dissimilar to a bunker. And in fact, the sole difference of it was being the goal, which was to keep potential damage contained within the structure, rather than keeping it out. As he put it, most of the structure was dug underneath the earth, which had the effect of making the underground complex seem so much smaller than it really was from the outside, as would be expected. There was only one way of entering and leaving the underground structure, and this was via a ladder that led from the small, unassuming concrete building on the surface, which I will refer to from now on as the entrance of the building for convenience, to the network below. After everyone had gone to bed at night, the hatch would be contained and the ladder would be sealed off with a very large, thick metal lid. Zimmerman was very strict about this. Located not too far away from the entrance of the building was a series of wooded cabinets that would serve as a sleeping quarters for Zimmerman's staff that he had hired. Compared to the entrance of the building standing on the surface, the underground system seemed to be massive. At the center of the complex was a control room. This is where all the facilities, electronics, and such were linked to. This included security cameras, lights, and door controls. Consoles and monitors and computers lined the walls of this large central chamber. This is also where the ladder and entrance of the building connected to the underground complex. Connected to the control room were three doors. One led to a smaller room that served as a infirm uh, infirmary. Another door led to a break room, and the last door led to the hallways. The hallways is where the complex started to feel extremely eerie. They were, for some reason, laid out in an extremely confusing scheme that led in circles and the complete dead ends. These hallways made up a vast majority of the complex, and it was very easy to get lost in a maze if you were unfamiliar with it. But. If you knew where you were going, you would find yourself standing before one of the three 8x8 rooms before long. Each room had a camera hooked up to one of the corners of the room, and all three of those were connected to a corresponding monitor in the control room. Cameras were also scattered throughout the hallways, so whoever was watching their corresponding monitor could see anywhere when they wanted to. Thick metal doors stood at the entrance of each of the three 8x8 rooms, and in order to open them, you would have to enter a four-digit code into a panel located near the door. I remember when I first arrived at the complex, and I, I, I also remember how badly the hallways frightened me. I've, I'm, I've always been claustrophobic, you see, and those hallways were very, very narrow. The noise, or more accurately, the lack of noise, was also a tremendous source for, of fear for me in those bleak, narrow hallways. It was always just so unnaturally silent. It was as if the world just stopped moving. It really made you feel like you're trapped down there. <sighs> Thankfully, though, I, I rarely ventured into those hallways, for I was only a medical professional in the facility, and I virtually had no reason to go into them. In the beginning, I found it so peculiar why Zimmerman would ask a medical professional like me on a project like this, but by the time it was over, I understood why. The official purpose of the Harbinger experiment was to test and observe the effects of extended isolation on the human mind. This is what was listed on the reports being sent out at least, but unbeknownst, to all those who were participating in the project, excluding the subjects. The true purpose was much, much darker. Like I said before, Zimmerman always had an obsession with the occult and supernatural. He sought to prove himself to those who did not believe him. He wanted physical proof that the supernatural was, was a real phenomenon. And he wanted to be the first to attain said proof. The true purpose of the Harbinger experiment was to find proof of medical-physical, and 
a world we cannot see. The thought of doing this was naturally a tad bit detaining and even scary, but Zimmerman's method of doing so was just truly terrifying. Zimmerman believed that he would be able to open a potential portal between worlds momentarily, allowing to see him to see random entities cross over into our world, and each one of those beings would be trapped in one of those three rooms. See, Zimmerman had a theory that any entity would try to latch onto the nearest living person that was in ca uh, capacity for it. He wanted to use this technique to trap a spirit in the physical form by allowing it to enter a physical being that had been injected with a compound mixture that Zimmerman had created. In theory, the compound would keep the entity from leaving whatever it was attached to. The only way it would be able to leave the host who was injected with the compound was through death. According to Zimmerman, the host would have to be something living, with a strong enough will to survive the possession, and there was only one known species that, possess <laughs> that possesses that amount of will required for this. Humans. Zimmerman had also done something to ensure that the entities would only enter the three rooms that he had specifically specified. Though I cannot, exa I cannot exactly say how he did it. But, in fact, I know next to nothing when it comes to Zimmerman and how he managed to do what he did. He liked to keep his methodology a secret, and only a secret to his most trusted staff and himself. Most likely due to the paranoia that someone would steal his ideas or take credit for the success of said ideas. If I had known that this was his true purpose before I signed up, I may have <laughs> reconsidered. But Zimmerman did not tell us until we were all gathered in his fortress. Even if you know any of us wanted to leave, I doubt we would have been allowed to do so. The security team Zimmerman was, you know, that he had hired was strictly loyal to him and the payout. It was not unlikely that Zimmerman had given out the order to not allow anyone to leave. There were three different subjects included in this experiment. All were native to Alaska and each one was lured into the project under the belief that they would be participating in a harmless study on the effects of, sight of isolation on the human mind. As I mentioned before, which is why none of the subjects objected when they realized that they would be confined to one of the three rooms that I mentioned earlier. The first subject was a young man. He apparently was out of work and desperately needed money that he had been offered for participating in the study. The second was a woman. By looking at her, I could tell that she was an addict of some sort. The third and final subject was an older man, a drifter I had guessed. One thing they all had in common was that none of them had any family or friends left. In short, none of them would be missed, which is why they were chosen for the project. I am sorry, and I, I honestly wish I could supply more information about the subjects, but this had been drawn from memory, and I was given little information on the three to begin with. The experiments did not officially begin till 1987, 16 years after the original announcement. I was eager to begin, so I packed up and headed out to the complex as soon as I could. I arrived at the compound a week before the subjects had even signed up, and a whole month before the project even began. I was not the first to arrive by any means, but when I got there, Zimmerman and his colleagues and the security team had already arrived. I suppose you could say... I was the first among the people Zimmerman did not trust to arrive. Everyone had arrived about a week before the experiment began. There was a noticeable rift between those who were simply in there for the money like me and those who are followers of Zimmerman. On October 15th, 1987, all the preparations were in place. The subjects had been sealed in the room and the cameras, lights, and speakers were fully operational and the staff members had settled in. The time has come for the experiment to officially begin. Zimmerman asked everyone to report to the control room around 9 p.m. to witness the beginning of the experiment. He wanted everyone to be present when he proved that all his theories had been correct and that he was just not simply a madman. He wanted us to see the fruits of his labor. When everyone had finally gathered in the large control room, Zimmerman told us and simply said, Observe. He had turned back to the microphone that would project his voice through all three rooms, and then he began to chant in a strange language. 
pit, I feel certain no one but Zimmerman could understand. We all observed the three monitors on the wall, silently waiting for something to happen. The subjects all stood in the room, dumbstruck by Zimmerman's chanting, staring at the monitors with a confused expression on their faces. After about five minutes, I felt something. Something awful. I, I can't explain exactly what it was, but... A horrible feeling of dread washed over me, riddling me with fear. It, it, it was then that the ground actually began to shake subtly, and then the lights began to flicker. Zimmerman continued chanting into the microphone as if nothing was off or wrong, while the subjects began dashing around their room, screaming for help. Then, suddenly, the ground stopped shaking, and a mother's uh, and the monitor's image turned to static. The air became very, very heavy as we all stared into the monitors, waiting for them to regain their image and show us what had been happening or what happened in the three rooms. For a while it was all silent, but then there was screaming. The screams of a woman going through unbearable pain and terror began to echo through the compound. The similar screams of men began to collide with the woman's terrified screams. And together, they mixed into an awful symphony of pain and I fear that this beat mercilessly into our ears. Those of us who were simply in it here for the mother money gave each other a scared look while the loyal Zimmerman fanatics seemed completely unfazed. They wanted us to leave and never come back to the awful place, but deep down, that Zimmerman would never allow that to happen. We were here for the log haul, and there was no escape. It was 10.13 p.m. when the screaming finally stopped and the monitors had yet to reveal to us what had occurred in those three rooms. As soon as the screaming ended, Zimmerman stood and dismissed us all for the night, adding that we are all forbidden to come back into the compound until 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Not like any of us wanted to, we all solemnly made our way out of the compound and towards the cabins and settled in for the night. I feel it's safe to say that not all of us slept well that night, and I was not one of them. The following morning, all of the staff had arrived at the entrance building. We all stood exchanging tired and nervous looks as we waited for Zimmerman to arrive and opened a hatch that could seal the ladder. I could see a pale fear look in those eyes of those who, again, only was here by, you know, the promise of money. Those who were not here for the promise of money remotely were unaffected by what happened last night. Zerman showed up about five minutes after ten, apologizing for his tardiness as he came through the door of the entrance building. He opened the hatch, and without any hesitation, began descending into the ladder downwards into the black abyss. He almost seemed enthusiastic. I was the first to follow Zerman into the dark descent into the facility. It seemed to be that the farther I climbed down, the more the darkness enclosed on me, as if it was trying to swallow me whole. And as I climbed deeper and deeper, I could not help but feel that the place was just different somehow. Well, before it was only unsettling with the concrete hallways and rooms, now there had been something else, something that made the eeriness of the entrance feel surreal and personified. I felt like a horrible, gruesome scene awaited us down there, but I continued to climbing downward, despite my fear and my hesitation. This was no longer a spooky bunker. There was darkness and a malevolence in the air. True evil lived there. I could feel it. Hell, we all could. I finally felt my foot touch the ground, and I let out a silent sigh of relief as I was on solid ground, almost as if on cue. The light bulbs came alive, dousing the room in their warm, welcoming light. Zerman must have turned on the power, I thought. I allowed myself to take a couple of seconds to examine the control room. It was exactly as we had left it last night, for which I gave a silent and thankful prayer. It was almost as if nothing unusual ever happened. I shook myself from my thoughts as I remembered the static. I felt the... <laughs> I remember the static of the mon monitors from last night before. I let my eyes slowly make their way towards the monitors on the wall, anticipating a grim, fearful scene that would be on them. My attention was first grabbed by the monitor one of three, which still was pure static. It would have been a small relief, but then the motionless image on monitor two caught my eye. 
Room 2 was entirely still, and everything seemed to be entirely untouched. I couldn't help but gasp as I noticed that the only thing was different is that the room lay in the center of the room, of the small concrete room. An expression of fear and terror was still frozen on her gaunt face, lying still and lifeless on her back. Zerman's expression turned angry when he saw this. He ordered that the second monitor be turned off, and it was. We didn't ask why. It's not like any of us wanted to see a dreadful scene any longer. He also ordered that if the image on the monitors 1 and 3 did return within the next two, hour next two hours, the security team would send, well, send someone to investigate the rooms. The security team nodded hearing this. They made it seem as if they had no fear, but I could see in their eyes. The subtly loud tick-tock of the clock was the only sound that echoed through the control room when I stared at the monitors. An hour and 15 minutes had gone by and the static was all that occupied monitor 1 and 3. All the other staff members were working, except for me. This was due to the fact that the project had been completely injury free thus far, so I essentially had nothing to do but wait for someone to hurt themselves. Zerman and a couple of colleagues and I were the only one that occupied the room. They quietly chattered amongst each other on the other side of the room while I spent my time reading and pondering the situation I had reluctantly found myself in. I had clearly made a mistake coming here. The corpse lying in the room, too, was evidence of this, and God only knew what awaited in room 1 and 3. My thoughts were soon interrupted as Monitor 3 images returned. The clear image was now displayed on the screen, and it made everyone's eyes noticeably widen. What displayed on the monitor was horrifying. A humanoid thing stood in the center of the room, staring directly at the camera, unmoving. It was wearing a jumpsuit that Subject 3 had been well issued. but. This clearly was not the same man that entered the room, and what caught my eye and my attention first were its eyes. They were solid black and twice the size of a normal human eye. They seemed so... so endless. So cold. Its... its head also... also... Its head had also grown the eyes in such a symmetrical and unsettling manner. The being also shed all the hair it once had. Even from the monitor, I could see that it was unnaturally smooth and, this <laughs> and clear the skin was. It had also seemingly grown in, in height and stature, which could only be seen by the fact that the jumpsuit was now obviously far too small for its wearer. Its limbs had grown exceptionally long, his arms almost <laughs> hung as low as a creature's knees. What? In the fuck were we looking at? There was no way that the same mad we had sent inside was this thing. Fear. Fear was all I felt as I continued staring at a monitor and that, that thing in that room. And my fear seemed to be shared by all those around me, which had made me feel kind of comforted in, in a way. It may sound awful, but it was a bit satisfying to see S Zimmerman and his colleagues feel the same fear too. But, at the same time, it was worrying because it showed me that this was not part of Zimmerman's plan. Something had gone terribly wrong. We all stared at the monitor, at the thing, despite our fear. It was almost as if we were in a trance. My already present fear had began to grow and spread rapidly through my body. I became lost in the creature's eyes trapped in its terrifyingly hypnotic gaze. After what felt like forever, I managed to break eye contact with the creature and divert my own attention to the monitor. And when I did, I felt my fear levels drop considerably. After a short while, Zerman ordered his security team to make their way into the subject's, <laughs> subject's one door, just as he would do. The security team left without question, armed only with batons and pistols. I focused my attention on watching the men progress through the hallways towards Subject 1's room, via the cameras, of course. Even though the they're not so high quality cameras, it wasn't hard to tell that these men were afraid of what waited, awaited them. Their heads were downcasted as they walked, they did not possess the same confidence within them as they once did when the project began. 
They looked scared, like scared boys being sent into a terrible war. Eventually, they made it to the door. We had perfect vision of them and the door via the hallway camera. One of them said something through their walkie-talkies and made motion towards the camera in response to one of Zimmerman's colleagues, which buzzed the door open. The man had their pistols out the entire time the button was pushed. Slowly, the door began to open. We all watched eagerly as the man began to approach the door, guns aimed inside. Suddenly, without warning, there was a loud shriek, and something bounded out of the room at a fucking unrealistic speed at the men. The monitor turned to static, and immediately we could hear screaming echoing down the hallways, followed shortly by a distinct sound of gunshots. We, we, we could do nothing but wait. After a couple of minutes, the screaming gunshots stopped. We all waited, and we all prayed hoping that whatever bounded towards them and at them in the room one would not reach the control room. After a couple of minutes, three men came back carrying one of them, carrying the corpse of the fourth. He had massive cuts covering his chest and face and was shredded. You couldn't even tell who he was anymore or if even he was human. It was just a pile of gore. Being a doctor and all, I felt somewhat unfazed by the mass of shredded flesh and bloodied meat that carried them, but many of the others were pale and vomited. The security team wore a emotionless expression, but eyes filled with pure abstract terror. One of the men finally looked up at us. He stared at us for a while with his wide eyes. It's dead. He m finally managed to mutter, shaken in a scared voice. A couple hours went by. The dead man's name was Frank. He was buried outside in the cold Alaskan ground. Two men were, that were unharmed, at least physically. The third was alive, but only barely. His body was covered in bloody slashes and one of his eyes had been gouged out. I managed to stabilize him, but only just. The other two men vaguely explained what happened. Apparently, Subject One leaped out of Frank after the door opened, and it was only... Only, it really wasn't Subject One anymore. According to them, a hideously contorted sh face and long, sharp claws... It was just vague. They claimed to shot it over a dozen times before it fell dead, and then they emitted another dozen bullets into it just to be sure that it was really dead. Only once it was dead, they came back. After tending to the wounded man, I went to investigate the monitors, as afraid as I was of seeing those monitors and what they may hold. I, I just needed to see. Subject 3 was the only one left now, and I needed to see to make sure that thing was still in this room. It seemed more like a jail cell than an ordinary room at this point, though, which is probably a good thing. The camera displaying Subject 1's room in the hallway outside displayed only static, which filled the screen. No one was sent to repair or investigate, we just hoped that Subject 1 was, well, truly dead. Monitor's 3 image was exactly the same as I had left it. All three was still standing in directly at the camera at us. He was still the exact same position, and if it was not for a small fan in the corner of the room, I would think that I was looking at a still image. In a way, I felt relief seeing this. Relief that he was still in his room and had not escaped while no one was looking. After everything quieted down, I noticed something especially unusual. There was a strange sound emanating from somewhere. At first, it was barely noticeable. The only reason why I heard it is because how extremely quiet it was in the infirmary. But, as time went by, it slowly began to increase in volume. After an hour or so, it was loud enough that everyone else could hear it too. After a couple more hours, the volume increased so much that we could determine what the noise was. It was a song. One of our staff members identified it as Living in the Sunside, Living in the Sunlight by Tiny Tim. Apparently, his father loved us to listen to that song frequently. The song seemed to loop and kept on replaying itself. Although we were able to identify the noise, it remained unable to identify its source. We knew that it wasn't coming from the speakers because, well, we, would, we had turned them off. It seemed to be emanating from the walls themselves. More time ticked as we all became increasingly agitated by the song. I spent most of my time in the infirmary attending to Frank or in the control room as fear hung in the air and the presence of this unmistakable darkness and evil was no doubt the source. 
Subject. Three still not moved. He had kept his unblinking gaze fixed on the camera the entire time. It felt like he was staring directly at me, no matter where I was in the room. It, this effect was apparently felt like by others due to the fact that they seemed to move around the room, and seemingly for no reason. After a few hours, the song was so loud that people almost had to shout in order to communicate. We had been trying to figure out the source so that we could turn off the damn song, but to no avail. The source was completely unidentifiable. This added level of extreme irritation to our already present fear. It was around 8.30 p.m. that the ground itself began to shake once again. Just as it done the previous night, panic began to spread among my fellow employees and I as her shaking grew intensely. During this, I had a sudden instinctual feeling that took over me, as Subject 3's monitor was gone, as if there was on cue the power went out. And thankfully, the damn song did as well. Ever since the security team came back, panic began to slowly building up amongst the staff. Zimmerman was powerless to stop it. When the lights went out, the calm projections that everyone had been trying to maintain left us, and the fear in our hearts took over. The emergency backup lights kicked on shortly after the power went out, which, gave, which I gave a silent, thankful prayer for. The lights were dim, but they still allowed me to see a lot. Total panic seized us as many of the fellow staff members began screaming and rushing for the ladder in the attempt to escape, but too many of them were trying to use it at once. No one was able to get very far in the ladder without someone else pulling them to the floor or taking their place. Zerman was shouting at everyone to calm the fuck down, but his dominating and intimidating personality had no effect here, and demanding, uh, <laughs> and his demands fell upon deaf ears. It was total fucking chaos. It, was, it wasn't was long until people actually started to hurting each other in a desperate attempt to get up the ladder. And, out of this place, I could only stand against the wall for my opportunity to escape up the ladder. All the screams were soon silenced by a familiar hum of that unsettling song that began to rise up in volume again much quicker this time. And this time, it was clearer than the noise that was coming directly from the maze-like corridors. People stopped fighting and shouting as all their attention shifted to the door in the hallways. The song quickly got louder and louder than it ever had been before, forcing many of us to cup our ears with our hands and attempt to silence the noise, but then suddenly, the song just completely stopped silence. That's all that fucking filled the room. As we all stared at the thick metal doors in anticipation of what was coming. It felt like ages had gone by, but in reality it's probably only a few seconds before the silence was broken. The door suddenly and violently burst open. The music started again louder than it ever was before. The suddenness of the volume caused many of us to recoil, falling to the ground, grabbing our ears in an attempt to block the noise. I glanced up for a second at the doorway. There stood a tall, darkened, skinned figure with long limbs, eyes so dark and malevolent that they could clearly see you in the dim light. After I got my bearings, I looked upwards at the creature once again, this time to see the thing pick up and rip Zimmerman in half in one fluid movement, dousing the room and everyone in it with its blood and intestines and organs. I was no stranger to gore, but the sight of this was too much for me to bear. I hunched over and after immediately seeing that I vomited all over the cold cement floor. The ladder was my only hope of survival. I thought to myself as I forced myself into a standing position, as my eyes rose along with the rest of the with me. I could see the thing ripping and tearing through people as they scattered about in an attempt to escape. It was distracted, and as awful as it sounds, this was my only chance to get the ladder. I forced my legs to move towards the ladder, trying to block out the terrified screams of my fellow staff members un and the unbearably loud music. I could hear gunshots considing with screams and terrible sounds of flesh being ripped apart and messes of gores and noises. I reached my hands forward and felt the wave of, I felt a wave of fresh relief fall over my fingers as I came into contact with the hard metal rungs of the ladder. I gripped it I gripped them and began to climb upwards quickly as I could disor in this disoriented state. All the while praying that the monster would not see me pull myself off the ladder and then pull me into the slaughter. I felt like at any moment I would feel one of its smooth hands wrap around my ankles and pull me to my death. 
and I eventually made it to the top. There was no question in my mind. I had to close the hatch and seal that damn thing down there. Even if it met the certain death of my colleagues, I, I could not allow that thing to escape. I gripped the thick metal lid and pushed it with all my might in an attempt to seal the underground, underground complex off. Despite how dense and sturdy it was, the lid was surprisingly easy to move. It didn't take much effort at all to push it over the hatch. Even in my weakened state, in seconds, the hatch was completely covered in a, in a dense metal lid. I collapsed to my side. I began to vomit as more exhaustion took over me, and I lay there. I realized something aside from my labored breaths. The only thing I could hear was a faint echo from the song down below. I felt as though if I were to lay there any longer, I'd lose my sanity if I listened to that song for another damn minute. So once again, I forced myself to my feet and began to make my way to the wooden lodge that I had stayed there the previous night. It was where I had left my baggage and where I left my keys to my truck. Of the 15 staff members that took part in the forsaken experiment, I am the lone survivor. I have never returned to the awful place where all this had happened, and I don't fucking intend to. This project was very secretive, and Zimmerman was the only one who knew all the details of it. And, as far as I know, no one is aware of my involvement aside from me. In fact, I'm probably the only one who knows of the Harbinger experiment and what truly was, let alone what actually happened. By now, you're probably wondering why I've told you all about this when none of you should be aware of it. Maybe some of you are expecting me to give you a speech about not messing with things you don't understand or those fucking lines. I hope not, because I have no such speech or lesson to impart. I began hearing noises earlier today and almost immediately recognizes as noise the very haunting yet familiar fucking song. I don't even... I didn't even try to trace it to its source. I knew it was pointless, and as the day progressed, the song had increased in volume. It's very loud. I can hear it now. And that I can clearly make out the lyrics. <laughs> I'm unable to escape Tiny Tim's voice, and it followed me everywhere I gone. <laughs> S -s Subject 3 is coming for me. And I, I, I know I don't have much time left. The world is extremely limited now. I, I guess. I guess that I just wanted to tell you of the tale of the Harbinger experiment before it was lost forever. <laughs> um, I, I, I hope that you take some time to take what, whatever lessons this has as I recounted to you. But I know you won't. Let's be honest. You don't believe a fucking word I just told you, and know what? I don't blame you. And I wouldn't blame if you if I were you. I'm just fucking insane. I told to you, this is nothing more than something to get your cheap goddamn thrills from. And you're probably mindlessly surfing the internet when you click this link that found yourself here. Whenever here may be reading this story, and to be honest, I don't give I don't really care if you believe me or not. Even if you do, it probably would stop you from trying to undercover the truth in the darkness that few of us ever seen. It certainly never stopped Zimmerman. If you want a lesson, look at what happened to him in seeking the truth. I pray none of you will ever discover this fucking truth. I pray that none of you ever see the evil I have seen. I hope that all of you get to live in your happy little ignorance that lies beyond the veil of what you can understand. It's here now. I can feel its black eyes burning into me, just as they did all those years ago. I am as much... I am as much to blame as Zimmerman is for this monstrosity that's now free to roam the world. Even if I was not the one to create it. I am sorry. And to those who are listening, please forgive me. Ah!